Welcome to the Growing in Grace podcast, where you can listen in on some casual conversation about the good news of Jesus without all of the inconsistent religious double talk. If you've ever struggled with feelings of hopelessness, guilt, and despair, or wondered if you're really right with God, it's time to discover the true freedom that comes with the gospel of unlimited and overflowing grace. Well, here we are again for another Growing in Grace podcast in our 18th year. Is that right, Joel? Wowza. Yeah. Yeah. We've gone through 17, so we have begun our 18th year. (laughs) All right. Let's keep it rolling, shall we? Uh, Mike Kapler here. That's Joel over there, Joel Brzezinski. And uh, we've been talking about, well, we had a few weeks there where we sort of took a break in the middle and and focused on our 17th anniversary programs. But last week, we kind of picked up on where we left off before that. And that uh, the, the nutshell version of what we've been talking about is forgiveness inside of the new covenant, the redemption, the eternal redemption that came through Jesus Christ. And that's kind of where we left off uh, last week. You know, Joel, there's a lot of people I kind of mentioned I was one of them last week when, when we were talking. There's a lot of people who can be very familiar with the pages in the Bible. You can have a lot of different Bible verses memorized, a lot of concepts memorized, uh, uh, even man-made doctrines that relate to your denominational perspective. Um, and you, you can have all of that knowledge about those writings, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have an understanding or a revelation of the gospel. And th- that's why this isn't just about the Bible. And, and I, I still think there's going to come a day where we maybe spend some weeks on the podcast just talking about the Bible. Some people will catch on to it, some people won't, and even Joel and I might not completely see eye to eye on it, Um, but the point here is it's all about Jesus. Now, the Bible does reveal some things to us, but it's a funny thing, Joel. Everybody, you know, everybody in Christendom, uh, they, they, they say that this is, this is their book. This, this is uh, based on what they believe. And yet you've got all these different beliefs and perspectives and even contrasts in different belief systems, even within corporate Christianity uh, and individual opinions about the Bible. And yet we all claim this is our truth. This is the truth which we stand by, and yet we don't agree on a whole bunch of it. So how does that work? (laughs) I think we'll talk more about that another time. A little bit of a teaser there, but I I mentioned that today because of uh, what we talked about last week, and, and that is Jesus brought us an eternal redemption. And I spent a lot of years of my life trying to tell people, okay, redemption, yes, but it's kind of up to you to make sure you reel that <laughs> fish in. And so let's uh, let's pick up where we left off here in Hebrews 9. Yeah, the security that we have in Christ is something that I believe is missed by a lot of people. Um, and, and I think it's that is a cause for a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry and fear in believers. I think that if, if it really came down to it, so many of the people that we've heard from over the years and what you and I have been through ourselves, Cap, and what so many believers are going through now when they are living with fear and anxiety, guilt, and these things, things like that. When it comes to their life in Christ, it's all based upon not understanding the security that we have in Christ, this eternal redemption, as it says in Hebrews 9, this eternal redemption that Christ secured for us. He did it on our behalf. We couldn't do it. You know, it's like we could do the best of the best of the best of the works of any other human being who's ever lived, and we still couldn't secure our own redemption. (laughs) We we still couldn't do it. You know, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the problem. That was the problem. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Whether it was the Jews who had the law, whether it was Gentiles who didn't have the law, everybody has fallen short of the glory of God, and there's nothing that we can do about it. Again, you can work and work and work and try to be good the rest of your life. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with, quote, being good. I mean, it's good to do good things. But none of your good works will ever do anything to secure uh, redemption, to secure forgiveness, to secure eternal life. It's what Christ has done. You know, in Hebrews 9 here, and throughout the book of Hebrews, the the writer is really contrasting the work that was done under that old covenant 
they were priests. God ordained there to be priests. And he said there would be bulls and goats, that, that their blood would be shed, and it was for the sins of the people. But the problem with that covenant was that people still ended up being at fault. The blood of bulls and goats still couldn't cleanse the conscience, still couldn't cleanse the people, still couldn't take away sins. It was as, uh, let me see here, uh, in verse 9 of Hebrews 9, it was symbolic it was symbolic. It, it wasn't something that was going to actually provide redemption, eternal redemption. But Christ came as the high priest of the good things to come, it says in verse 11. And I won't repeat everything we did last week, but that's where the difference was. That's where the difference came in. Christ came. And uh, in verse 15, well, verse 13, so, uh, the blood of bulls and goats the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? It's the blood of Christ, where the blood of bulls and goats couldn't do a thing. And as Gentiles, we weren't even part of that thing. There weren't even goats and bulls and and blood to do anything for us. We were just far off. We were out of the picture as far as all of this went, but yet we've been brought into this thing because of what Jesus has done. You know, Paul had written that you who once were far off have been brought near by your good works, by all the good things you've done. No, you have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. And so all of this is based upon the blood that Jesus shed. It's based upon what he did, and none of it is based upon what we have ever done or can ever do of course and 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 that's the problem with people who want to try to tell you that salvation can be lost Mm -hmm. Uh, you have it you don't have it sometimes you get it back Uh, it depends on your dedication and rededication the thing they can't tell you specifically is what do you have to do to be saved to stay saved and what would occur or lack thereof, for you to lose that. Exactly what would you have to do to lose it, and what do you have to do to keep it specifically? I mean, I want line items in there, like it's a tax (laughs) form from the U.S. government. You know, I I want lots of words in there telling me exactly what is required here. You know, when you were mentioning uh, verse 9, well, you weren't just in verse 9, but one thing that is mentioned here in verse 9 the, the, these things uh, under the old covenant, the Holy Spirit, these holy places, the, the, the temple, the, the taking of the blood, the, the sacrifices that not only occurred once a year, but daily with the, with the priests trying to cover the sins, to bring an atonement, to a temporary forgiveness, all of that stuff, it was symbolic for that time. Yeah, when I was a kid, Joel, uh, I wasn't real big into it, but because I wasn't maybe all that good at it, but... Back then, uh, you got, we're going back many decades here. I don't know if, if young people even still bother with this sort of thing anymore, or maybe there's an, a Lego thing or something out there that they're into, but we used to build models, oh, model yeah. cars, model this, model that. I even had model monsters, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, like Frankenstein or the Gill Man, and, and their heads would glow in the dark. That mm-hmm, was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Um, th- th- that's what the old covenant was. It, it was... It was just symbolic. It was just a model. It wasn't the real thing. It wasn't the real Mustang out in the driveway. It was just uh, something that sort of looked like that. And and that's what the old covenant was. And th- th- that blood of, of bulls and goats, the sprinkling uh, of that blood to for the purification of the flesh, uh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, how much more will he purify our conscience from dead works to mm-hmm. serve the living God? Dead works can look real good, too, by the way. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, old covenant stuff, trying to follow the law, trying to follow the rules, trying to follow the stone commandments, that was just all dead works. That was all fleshly. That was all That yes. was all dead works, right? Yes, yes. The contrast here between that fleshly ministry, condemning ministry, uh, a failed ministry— uh, to this new way that came through Jesus, the mediator, verse 15 of, of Hebrews 9, the mediator of a new covenant. 
a different covenant, not like the first covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal, there it is again, the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems from the transgressions committed under the other covenant, the first one. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated uh, without blood. It was not dedicated without blood. Um, and so the, the point here is, if this is all new to you, the point here is that Jesus, uh, that, that word will, for where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. In different versions of the Bible, you will find uh, several different words with that. Uh, this is the ESV, where a will is involved. Um, I believe the New King James calls it a, a testament. Some translations call it a covenant, but it all comes from the same Greek word. So where, there, where a covenant is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established because, you know, I've used this example before, but when my, when my dad died many years ago, his will that he had made did not go into effect until he died. And that's how it was with Jesus. This covenant would go into effect at his death not his birth, like what some people might think, because, you know, the New Testament started with the birth of Jesus, but that's not when the New Covenant began. And so, but even with this covenant, like the first one, it had to be dedicated uh, with blood. The difference is Jesus only had to shed his blood one time for the eternal redemption, the, the eternal redemption involved within this New Covenant. Yeah, and that's... See. I mean, that's where, again, all the difference in the world is found in, in what you were just talking about, in, in the difference between the, the covenants. And this is such a big thing. And I believe it's one of the biggest things that the church of today, uh, that the body of Christ is missing out on. We will read, again, I think I mentioned John the Baptist last week, in, in the words of Jesus, we will read the words of Jesus before the cross and we will try to implement those words into our lives in Christ. And we will read things like, if you don't forgive others their sins, your Father won't forgive you. And we'll read that as if that's part of our life in Christ. Not realizing, not understanding the difference of the covenants. It was with the death of the testator. So, like you said, you were reading from the ESV. And one that I've been more familiar with, the version is New King James, although I do like the ESV. You were talking about how where there is a, a will, where a will, will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. Or for where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. So Jesus had not yet died when he was doing his earthly ministry to the Jews who were under the law. And a lot of what he said was law talk, was old covenant talk. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. But, of course, this, this new covenant is based upon the blood of Jesus. And so this is all building upon what the writer has said in the, in the previous chapters about the will of God, you know, the, this covenant about God making an oath, about the blood of Jesus being shed, about all of these things happening because uh, of the sins of the people, the old covenant sacrifices being symbolic, and a new testament being needed. You can go back to Hebrews 8, the previous chapter, to find out, I think, more about that. The old covenant was made obsolete in order to make way for this new covenant, this new testament, this new will. And so it's all based upon the blood of Jesus, not our works. We'll pick up more next week on forgiveness, God's forgiveness, this eternal redemption that we have in Christ. Stick with us on the Growing in Grace podcast. This has been Growing in Grace with Mike Kapler and Joel Brzezinski. Heard online through various internet sources around the world each week. Access past programs by visiting growingingrace.org. Share it with a friend and listen again next week for more Growing in Grace. Growing in Grace.